This lecture is about water conservation in our landscaping practices. And to start off the lecture, just wanted to point out to you some reasons for why we would want to try to conserve water. I know a lot of you know the reasons why, and maybe they're kind of obvious, but I'll restate some of those anyways. And the reason to reiterate these reasons for water conservation isn't so much to educate you, but just to remind you of the things you can present to your clients about the reasons to switch over to maybe water conserving irrigation systems and water conserving plants and taking care of your soil so water is conserved. Things like that that you'll be re reiterating to them saying here's why we want to try these things and here's may why you may want to try these water conservation techniques or plants um, in order to save money. Like it says here water prices continue to climb of course, our water resources are becoming more scarce, and that's a relative word. It just means there's more people using more, and we have more drought in our region. Um, a lot of groundwater pumping is happening right now, too, but that also will be used up. Um, uh, people in North America, especially the United States, use a lot more water per capita than in many other countries, and that's another reason to bring us back a little bit more in line with the the ecosystems that we live in here and I'm using the amount of water that can be provided naturally by the ecosystem rather than a lot more and having to bring in some like a lot of our water or not a lot but a good chunk of our water comes from northern California here in the south coast and that isn't really ecologically sustainable over the long term and a lot of energy is used to move water around to get it here. So Kachuma is, I think there's, it's five to 10% state water is used to fill Kachuma. So if it gets really empty, we have drought years down here in the south coast, it still has some water left in it because water is brought down in aqueducts from Northern California. And all the building of that infrastructure takes a lot of energy and sometimes fossil fuels. A little more data on that topic. How much energy is used in California to move water from one place to another? 25% of the total energy budget, all the money the state spends annually on energy systems and infrastructure, 25% of that, a quarter, is for moving water around to different users. And that means water, moving water from areas of the state that have higher water amounts to areas that have lower, so people can live in Palm Desert and here in Santa Barbara where we don't have enough water for the people that are here. So we have to bring it in from somewhere else. And that takes a lot more water and a lot more commitment to infrastructure. You can see here a very simple map of some of our water catchment systems. Um, we have going down the San Inez River, more near the headwaters, Jamison Lake, then a little bit lower down Gibraltar Reservoir, and then even lower down, of course, you all know Kachuma Lake. Those are all reservoirs human built stopping up damming up the water to create a pool of water behind it from which we draw and the water comes through the mountains through tunnels in the mountains along those three reservoirs into this the kind of relative areas that um, are closest to that so a lot of water from for downtown santa barbara comes from gibraltar especially montecito and from kachuma goleta from kachuma and also, uh, if you head all the way to the east, Jamison feeds more of the Carpentaria Summerland area. The average waterfall in um, our precipitation rainfall in this area is about 18 inches per year, but it ranges from 8 to 21 inches on average. Most rainfall occurs November through March. Thus, we live in a semi arid climate, like uh, some people call this a coastal desert. And it fills the local reservoirs and the water can also percolate down into local groundwater basins but it doesn't provide enough water for all our needs especially during the dry years so that's why we have some state water coming down also from um, you can see way up near santa maria is the twitchell reservoir but the state system comes through um, the coastal range kind of up closer to san luis obispo and some of it is piped all the way to kachuma a similar illustration showing you at least these two, um, Gibraltar and Lake Kachuma, and how the water comes through tunnels through the mountains and comes down to the city water treatment plant and then also pumped back out to the rest of the city. Um, and also showing you that the state water project, some of that goes into Phil Kachuma too, just to make sure we have enough. 
the recycled water that you see in the pink pipes um, in Santa Barbara. This was built in two phases, completed in 89 and 91. It provides about um, 800 acre feet per year, about 700,000 gallons per day to irrigate the landscaping here in the Santa Barbara area and the city. Um, it's tertiary treated, which means that it is um, actually, uh, you can swim in it, but it's not considered safe to drink. It is probably safe to drink, but because it's recycled, it does have some other things in it that make it um, more of a, a little bit more risky. So, um, and it's all the water that is recycled. So taken from um, these used water systems and recycled at El Estero water treatment plant goes um, east and west to parks, schools, golf courses, and homeowner associations. Just a select few, as you can see there in the green, big users, not everywhere. It doesn't go to residen residential um, properties. So it's just for these big users that it goes out to right now. And it helps. Approximately half of all the residential water use in the city of Santa Barbara is for outdoor landscaping. In Montecito, it's about 80% of the water that comes to that home is used for landscaping. That's mostly because the, the, their bigger, um, bigger property sizes, the house is a smaller percentage of the whole property, so you have more outdoor landscaped areas. But the biggest water use inside the home, clothes washers and toilets. Good reason to conserve where you can in those areas. Some water use in the Santa Barbara stats um, from 88 to 92, there was a big drought. We've recently had another one um, that's still ongoing here in Santa Barbara. Um, and during that time, the city of Santa Barbara restricted landscape irrigation to zero use. You know, people's lawns died um, or went very dormant and a lot of plants were lost. Um, so there were major landscaping impacts. A Gibraltar Reservoir was completely empty. Kachuma Reservoir was at 25%. That was probably almost all state water that was filling that. And that's when they were, uh, the city was inspired to build a desalination plant, taking ocean water and desalinating it and using that as a water source. And then our more recent drought in 2012, 2019, which really isn't over. We had a good year in 2020, but um, we're still way below our averages and the reservoirs are not full. Groundwater is not pumped by the city of Santa Barbara and used to send out to residences and municipalities, but the state regulations are beginning groundwater. They're mandating groundwater management plans throughout the, um, the whole state and Santa Barbara is one that has to do one too. And the desalination plant is just in case we don't have enough water um, groundwater pumping will um, has become much, really popular on private lands, um, but because we have to do a management plan, um, it makes it a little trickier to just bring that online for the city use. But um, we, there's no more willy-nilly groundwater pumping by lots of private owners. They now have to get permits. Um, they always had to have a permit, but it's, it's stricter now because we're seeing that groundwater is now going to be used up if we don't you know, take care city of Santa Barbara and the county have joined forces a while back to promote water conserving techniques in landscaping. The Water Wise Gardening program, website, videos, um, helps give lots of tips and methods for conserving water and landscaping. They can provide irrigation evaluations, water checkups, audits. They can come out to a site and say, uh, look at how you are irrigating your plants and maybe even the plants you're using and the irrigation hardware and suggest ways for water conservation. And they will also provide rebates for the money you spend up to a certain amount. Um, it's $1,000 per residential property at the moment if you qualify. And then if you go buy some things to um, improve your water conservation on your site, they'll pay for up to $1,000 of all that um, plants and hardware and things to do that. The waterwisesb.org um, waterwise website provides um, landscape watering calculator and watering index to help you be more conserving in your irrigation systems and how you um, program them. And the Green Gardener program is an educational program which can provide you lots of sustainable landscaping techniques, including water conservation. Three very simple techniques to conserve water in your landscape. 
choosing plants that are uh, water conserving. They don't use a lot of water just by their natural genetics and where they're, the climates they're adapted to. Also using irrigation controllers, which can adjust the amount of water that comes out related to the temperatures and the climate as the climate changes. So you would never have an ear of like a sprinkler system on or a drip system on during a heavy rain. They, these um, controllers, sometimes called smart controllers, that gather and take in weather data into their uh, programming system can adjust for that. And then ir other irrigation techniques. We'll talk about each of these. Some examples of water-wise plants. Plants that are adapted to Mediterranean climates like our own and the Mediterranean and a few other areas of the world in parts of Australia and Chile and South Africa and Australia. Um, Mediterranean that have Mediterranean climates and we do too. And our native plants are adapted to our climate as are other plants adapted to those other Mediterranean climates throughout the world. And all those plants from all those regions can handle these long, hot, dry summer and fall and cool, wet um, winters. Wholesale and retail nurseries carry a lot of these plants. Um, you can go to local demonstration gardens that show you how these look in the landscape when they're mature. There's a fire, um, a fire friendly garden demo garden up on Sheffield Road near the fire station that can show you lots of different ways you can do uh, landscape with plants that um, help. They're all Mediterranean plants and so they do well in our climate, but they also are um, create a low fire hazard around your home. Um, Seaside Gardens is another good place to see a lot of these plants. Um, and check out the Waterwise Gardening website, waterwisesb.org. And they even have a searchable database for waterwise plants. So some tips on planting plants for water conservation. First, you have to understand the life history of your plant to know what is it? Is it an annual, biennial, which means it grows for two years and then dies. Annual grows for one year and then dies. Perennials grow more than that. So year, they go a few years or more or many years <clears throat> before they reproduce and die. And there are ferns and mosses, grasses, bulbs, shrubs, trees are um, in the perennial category. Um, there are also many different uh, annuals too, but water conserving plants um, typically are in the perennial zone because they form they live longer and they form bigger root systems which can gather more water and get the water they need even if there is a drought. Also understanding your plant's natural growth form can help you figure out if it's going to be a good addition to your garden as far as water conservation goes. Is it an herb, a shrub, a tree, a vine, a ground cover, cactus or succulent? This helps you determine how much space it's going to ultimately take up, um, how to set up your irrigation system for when it's young and keep that irrigation system flexible so it can allow that plant to mature and still receive adequate water and also not too much water, how to fertilize that plant or add back, um, bacteria rich or fungal rich compost tea. So, Knowing the plant's growth form can help you adapt your whole system to make sure it's conserving water. Third in our list here of figuring out plants to help in water conservation in your landscape is knowing the plant's water use. Um, is it a drought resistant plant? Is it adapted to dry areas or desert areas? Is it a moderate use plant, heavy water use, or aquatic plant? Um, Clearly, if you have to be adding a lot of water aside from natural rainfall, it's not very sustainable a type of plant for your site. We don't get a lot of rainfall here, so Mediterranean plants, like I mentioned earlier, are going to be the best choice for your garden here for water conservation. Also understanding the light requirements that your plant has. Um, is it a shade loving plant? Does it like filtered light, partial sun, full sun? This helps you put the plant exactly where it needs to be to do well on its own. If it's a shade loving plant and you put it in the sun, it won't do very well. Um, if it's a sun loving plant and put it in the shade, it also won't do well. And when plants are not in the climate or in the light 
um, kind of regime that they're used to or ad genetically adapted to, they struggle more and they need more additional help with interventions like pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers um, and sometimes um, more water. If you've got a shade loving plant that's getting too much sun, it's going to dry out faster and the leaves will burn. You'll have to be adding more water. So that's just part of the whole idea of thinking holistically about the plant and what it's adapted to, to reduce um, lots of inputs. One of those is, in, is water. The fifth thing to help you understand how to choose plants for water conservation is understanding the climate they're adap adapted to. We've already talked about things related to climate, like the amount of rain and the sun. But specifically, climate refers to latitude and elevation, the amount of ocean influence, continental air influence, storms coming off the continents or off the ocean are those last two, mountains, hills, valleys that can change the weather at a micro scale, and then microclimates too. All these factors um, and a lot more go into influencing the climate can greatly affect your landscape plants, including the amount of water they need and how well they do. Also understand or use the hardiness zones, the USDA hardiness zones or plant zones. They're very similar to the Sunset Western Garden zones that tells you um, about the climatic zone you're in and what plants are um, going to be useful and be adapted to that zone. It can help you choose the right plants for that place, which can lead to water conservation too. To decide on and understand your water conserving theme in your yard, would you like to use firescaping plants that tend to slow the fire front down, decrease flame length and heat of the fire around your home and animal structures? These tend to be very water conserving types of landscapes, the fire scaping. Xeriscaping, another word for just real low water use, very drought tolerant plants like cactus, succulents. Those are great um, for water conserving. Mesoscape is something kind of in between where it uses a little bit more water. Plants that like warm and wet tropical and temperate forest climates um, are something that are, look pretty like a Hawaiian garden lots of you know tropical plants. Um, maybe a few of these or a smaller area if you really like these plants and minimize them because they are very water consuming or they're not water conserving. So try not to have your whole yard be filled with these. Aquascape is just plants that live in water or very close to water. These also are not water conserving. You can often get plants that look or similar to the ones that you like, like say a willow tree that grows right in water. You like that look of it luxurious kind of weeping form that feels um, pleasant and maybe is representative of water nearby. You can get drought tolerant plants um, like Australian willow, which is uh, does not live near water, has the same type of delicate um, flowing weeping form, but it's not a plant that needs to be or in or near water. Of course, native plants, native South Coast California plants are great for water conservation. You can add them to existing non-native beds that you already have, slowly maybe phasing out some of the more water consuming things. Just make sure they're compatible with the irrigation that you already have on your non-natives, your ornamentals. Um, a common mistake is around the Central and South Coast is putting water loving species like lawns under oak trees, but the oak trees can't handle the water regime of the lawn which needs to be wet all year long, and that can cause root rot in the oaks. The following slides are some examples of specific California natives and how you can use them in your landscape. There are some great grasses that are water conserving, like the deer grass, the Muhlenbergias, and some of the pretty and really popular muleys, as they're called, um, varieties like the um, muley, Muhlenbergia, Pink flamingo is one that produces sprays of really fine pink flowers and inflorescences. Beautiful. Succulents like our native Dudleya. Don't take them out of the natural areas though. They're kind of becoming rare out in the wild because people like to dig these up. But you can buy them in garden stores. Uh, the Matillaha poppy, big empty space, produces lots of flowers uh, for a good chunk of the year. 
let's say you have some camellias which like a shadier, wetter, high water use environment, kind of like acidic soils, moisty and sh moist and shady areas. Some other types of plants that are natives that you could put in there to um, kind of fill out that and switch over to natives are things like the giant chain fern, uh, coral bells, and yerba santa. Here are some ideas for any property that ha already has a eucalyptus or carimbia um, species on it, like the lemon gum or the sweet gum or the California pepper. Um, underneath those trees t um, is usually pretty dry, partial sun because it's a little bit shady. And they tend to be low fertile soils. That's partly why people planted them where they planted them is they could, those um, gum trees and the pepper tree can handle those bad soils. But some things that also can do well in that situation underneath them are like our slender field sedge or the um, native woodland strawberry and the native Catalina perfume plant, which is really nice and has a good fragrance as you might guess. Some companions for rosemary as a ground cover or low shrub, which is a place where it would have a dry habitat, low organic matter. So some place that already has rosemary in it, you could switch over to natives and plant things like the flannel bush, California buckwheat, which can come in great different variety of colors from real delicate white to big white or bright pink or muted pink and St. Catherine's lace as well. So switching it up a little bit, I'm showing you a Western redbud here on the left image and that is a native. So some non-natives that could go well with that dry, sunny and low organic matter soil type of situation are the rock rose, rosemary or butterfly bush. Some other non-native plants that do really well um, planted interspersed with natives, star jasmine, oleanders, other succulents, they're all adapted to dry climates and not that great of soils and so they can be mixed in with our natives. A lot of our natives don't really want really fertile soil um, because it holds too much water and they're used to going dormant for long periods of the year when it's hot and dry here. So if you have really fertile soil that have, has moisture sitting on their roots at a time when the roots are dormant and that dormant and that causes root rot. Use nitrogen fixing plants wherever you can too. Um, plant trees and perennials that naturally have those associations with the nitrogen fixing bacteria, the legumes, um, and or you can do cover crops like clover, alfalfa, lupins that build the soil around the shrubs and trees. Some tropical trees like lucana, ice cream bean tree, saman, silk tree, tipu, cassia, many others are in that legume family and will, as they grow, they, they will enrich the soil beneath them with nitrogen and help out other plants. In case you didn't know, not all legumes are nitrogen fixers and some non-legume plants do fix nitrogen. Um, all of these plants, they um, have bacteria that live in nodules on their roots which take in nitrogen from the gases inside the soil and give it to the plant. And if you cut or prune back or even coppice, which means cutting to the ground some of these plants that can handle it, that releases the nitrogen that's in the roots into the soil. So it builds soil fertility in that area. Some nitrogen fixing plants for landscaping, um, things in the Robinia genus, the locust trees, this is showing you the hairy stem locust, but any locust is going to be a great nitrogen fixer and provide a nice tree for you as well. The mimosa or silk tree, Albizia julibrissa, is also a great tree, really nice spreading canopy, pretty um, delicate leaves, um, and will also enrich your soil with nitrogen. As mentioned earlier, the western redbud, a California native, is a great nitrogen fixing small tree for your landscape. And our native California white alder that grows deep in our a little bit wetter canyons and ravines in the south coast, Alnus rhombifolia. That is a nitrogen fixer and is a great tree for a spot. It does require a, a moderate amount of irrigation though. There's also a, um, a, a related species, Alnus cordata, the Italian alder, and that's fast growing native to Europe, but hardy here and doesn't require quite as much water. Still likes to have its feet when it's wet when it's young though, so keep it watered the first few years.